Divine Truth. The name of this presentation is Love Has Power Over Evil. And it is part of the Lessons in Love series. It was presented in Dallas, Texas, USA on the 19th of February 2012. This is session one, part two. Carolyn is, Carolyn is ready. Carolyn is ready. Good morning, AJ. <laughs> Good morning, my friend. How are you? Good morning to everybody. Good morning, Good morning AJ. AJ. Good to see you. Yeah. Where's my hat? <laughs> I just it has to have a history, mate. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Oh, you really are in Texas now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't got the boots though. For it. <laughs> you got <laughs> um, What we were thinking of doing today, uh, we know that some of you are heading back today, but uh, some of you aren't. And uh, what we wanted to do today was we, we were thinking of we'll finish sort of our formal stuff, if you like, or before three o'clock. But from three to five, what we're going to do is probably just continue um, having some discussions with you, if you'd like to, for those of you who'd like to stick around to do that. And then we were thinking at six o'clock, or around about, that we'd like to go out to dinner. Um, to There's a restaurant nearby called Lava Ten. Um, when I say nearby, it's probably how many miles away would it be? Three or four. Three or four. Yeah. It's a little expensive. Um, yep. So should we go for PF Chang? Is PF Chang cheaper or more expensive? <laughs> but but it's less popular, isn't it? This lava tent. Uh, it's yeah, the, less busy. Crowd, but it's, it'll be Sunday at what time? Probably six-ish. Six. I was going to suggest that we take a show of hands and I could put the table. table. Yeah. When you say expensive, what what do you call expensive? Per per meal. I, yeah, more like 20, where I think the agenda is sort of 10 or 15. Yeah, yeah. Rather than more Yeah, which is more what we all normally pay in Australia <laughs> when we go out to dinner. So for two of us, when we go out to dinner in Australia, we don't get any change from 60 or 70 bucks generally. Wow. And, and our exchange rate now is better than yours. So, uh, so yeah, you, you don't realise in, in America, like I said, how much uh, cheaper it is to actually live here in comparison to other countries, and in a lot of in a lot of different ways, and, and food, going out to dinner is one of them, and and so when we come here, we love going out to dinner, <laughs> <laughs> particularly if there's a good restaurant. So, so, um, some of you went to PF Chang's last night, did you not? Yes. yes. A lot of you, by the sound. Yes. <laughs> How many of you went to PF Chang's last night? Yes. <laughs> Did you enjoy your meal? Yes. Yeah. 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 We went to Uncle Buck's last night. Uncle Buck. <laughs> and it's beautiful. Is it? It was a gorgeous place. Yeah. And, and it was a nice atmosphere. What I liked about PF Chang's is there's a lot of vegan and vegetarian dishes, and all of them are awesome, aren't they? Yeah. 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 And apparently, Lava Ten's got a good selection as well of vegan and vegetarian dishes, so that's one reason why we've selected it. We thought PF Chang's for most of you two nights in a row might be a bit much. <laughs> um, however, if that's not the case, we're very happy to go along with PF Chang's with you and book that one. And who would prefer to go to PF Chang's again? Um, how many of you want to go to the same restaurant again? <laughs> Not many. <laughs> okay, so so the option is the option is lava ten, and who would like to come? It'll be six-ish if you can. But how many would think would we think? So perhaps if we can count that. So if you leave your hands up. Right that side. <laughs> no, no. 31, 32, 33. 33. 
Yeah. You lift your hand up. Who wouldn't want to go to supper with Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> it might be our last time. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't have resisted. <laughs> So, um, so what we need to do is bring that through. Obviously, that's a lot of people yeah. going at once. So, so 33, and if we can call them and let them know. Um, and if we make it, is everyone comfortable with 6, or would you like to make it a bit later? 6 is okay. If we finish here around 5-ish, um, it gives us time to go home and strip off. You need to, whatever you ask, you need to do. Um, okay, is there any other things we need to... Oh, hard disk drives. Um, if any of you do have hard disk drives, yes, um, there's a chart... When are you leaving? Tonight. Tonight. Uh, we have to leave. They take six hours to copy. So if you can leave them, leave it with Michael, with a return address, like so that he knows how to get it back to you, that would be awesome. And I'm happy to copy it over the next few days, but, but someone will need to send it back to you. Um, any other one else who wanted a hard disk copy? Oh my God, Everyone's fine? Yeah. Okay. Also, Mike has kindly copied um, the Essentials DVDs, you know, the pack of five. Oh, okay. There's free copies there. There's free copies of the pack of. What well, you feel are the Essentials, is it? Uh, the, the seven DVD sets. The Sintro pack. The Sintro pack, basically. Yes. And I didn't have time to copy the secrets, so. I put my contact information there and I will send that out. No worries. So free DVDs. So there's free DVDs at the back, courtesy of Michael. Thank you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and it's up the back there somewhere on the, on the desk. Okay. Yeah. And Michael also clarified that Secret Secret was in 2009. Oh, it was in 2009. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can't believe that <laughs> I doubt whether she will look at it anyway. Do you doubt it? Yes, because it was all just a facade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what you saw yesterday was evil in action. Yeah. But uh, many of you did not recognise it, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. The evil, the evil in action. Yeah, the evil in love thing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely brilliant for you. But there was actually can, can you explain some people. That? Can you yeah, explain? I will explain. Yeah. I will explain. Remember one of the things that we all agreed that was a part of evil was control? Uh, manipulation, <coughs> deceit. Uh, I before he yeah. said after tea, um, and those kind of emotions. Yeah, you saw it in action yesterday with the media crew. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lady down here sitting down the front who was a plant. Oh, she was. Yes. She's with the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. Oh my God. And she was perfect. Pers she was chosen to to just be like an actress, um, waiting, and they were waiting. And then the guy next to her was actually a cameraman, and they were just waiting and waiting, waiting until the guy who had flown down from uh, Los Angeles had arrived, and and. Brought a camera, of course, and all those other things with him, so that we, they could film Jesus saying he's Jesus. That was the only that was the only point to the whole thing. And and um, there was a very large degree of facade in this entire process, of course. Now, she, of course, uh, desired to have everybody feel that she was actually sincere, but she was not sincere at all. She was just an actress doing her actressing. She was pretty good. She was pretty good. <laughs> How many of you felt for her? I didn't like her. Yeah. 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 And, and, and the crew uh, came quite primarily because they have been sent by some people in Australia to come um, to, to actually do another thing on us in Australia, attacking thing on us in Australia. And uh, and like I could see all of that happening, so but that's the way it goes, and we have that happening often now with the media generally. We have yet to have, in fact, any honest interaction from any media person, yeah, where they just fake they fake everything in order to get the shot they want, and, um, and then they fill in the background. Then they fill it all in, yeah, they fill it all in and cleverly edit the whole thing, 
And so when you, it'll be very interesting when you watch it. <laughs> because you being here will see what actually happened and then what actually gets presented. Which is two very, very different things, right? <laughs> very different things. But AJ, I like the way you referred them to go and watch, you know. Yeah. You, were, you, you were on it, right? You understood what was happening? Yeah, I understood what was happening. Because um, in a way, it could be for other people to go and watch whatever. <laughs> yeah, and we need to use we need to use oh, the mic. Yes, so, yes. So, <laughs> otherwise, uh, so what what say did you just say? Because I uh, you weren't here. <laughs> repeat performance. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just making the point that maybe some good could come out of it, and that they could be referred to what AJ had referred her to. Yeah. But you're saying they probably won't use that. So. No. Yeah. No. Not Too bad. Yeah. The the only reason for them being here was to create another attacking piece, and and it was interesting because he wanted me to do an interview afterwards, uh, which it took me twenty five minutes to to. He, he, see, the the problem with most people in the media is they believe that if you've got a smile on your face, that it means they always have a chance with you. Interesting. Right? So when you say no, they go they just come at a, another angle. And then when you say no, they're, they're very good salesmen. They say no again, and they come at it with another. And no, and this is the reason why, and they come at, at another angle, and so forth, right? And they just say no, no, no. And, and it took 25 minutes for me to say no, you're not getting an interview. Um, because, because the last time you had an interview, you totally lied about us and misrepresented us. And he said, but that wasn't me. <laughs> and I said, well, it's highly likely it's going to be you. However, um, the truth is that the issue I have is with the, with the uh, company you work for. So my suggestion is to go back to the company you work for, which is Channel 9 in Australia, and say to them this. When you're willing to undo the false stuff that you presented last time, and publicly air the fact that you presented all this false material last time, then I am perfectly happy to do an interview with you again. You say that to them. And I said even to them that it's an opportunity for them to prove that there is some integrity in the media. <laughs> <laughs> and he said to me, yeah, the likelihood of that happening is zero. The likelihood of that happening. Um. Is Channel 7 and Channel 9 connected? Is it the same company? No. Or, was, or Channel 9 also did a... a Channel 9 did uh, a series a misrepresentation. of over oh, three days, okay. actually, in Australia. Yeah. And the reason why they did over three days is they got the highest rating for the first couple of days uh, with their show, and so they did it for three days. And it was all just about misinformation, like, you know... Um, there, it's hard. We don't want to go into all of the details, but there's a, a lot of lies here. It is interesting because the, the woman who was sitting there, that from the, she said she worked with the Dallas Cowboys, and I was going back to my room, and she stopped me and asked me if I would just be willing to answer some questions. And I said, sure. And so every question they asked, I gave them an, an honest answer, and it wasn't what they wanted to hear. And they kept trying to get me to say, something else exactly like you know like do you believe he's jesus and i said well it doesn't matter and he, but do you personally i said well not the jesus that everyone is has has changed and made what they want it to be yeah. but he, i know that'll be edited out <laughs> you know yeah. so it'll be interesting to see if he, if any of it is kept yeah. and how they work it yeah and it's highly likely that there were some uh, microphones being used while you were being asked questions. Just as there was a camera on me the entire time that I was being asked questions when I said no to an interview. Uh, so uh, we'll see what happens with that too. And, and what I liked about all of these interactions is that each step they take, they demonstrate their own deceit. And that's a very good thing because eventually all of us will start questioning whether what we're seeing on the media is actually real. Right? Now, many of you have seen already in the in England. Yes, the different. Have you heard about the media big media furor in England uh, that occurred through Murdoch Publishing? Um, yes. 
and uh, and lots of lots of uh, journalists are even being uh, uh, have been indicted for. Um, Remember, some have been put in jail. Some have been put in jail or, or they have to go to court for... They've been put under arrest uh, for tapping, for illegal tapping and so forth. This happens very frequently. And, uh, and all they're doing is demonstrating their own evil intent, their deceit and so forth. And the best way to combat it is with love. Some love yeah? and, and the guy couldn't understand yesterday why I wouldn't want to have an interview given the power of the media. Right? <laughs> and he couldn't understand me saying no to him at all. So he just went on and on and on. I said no again and no again and no again and no, it's not going to happen. And he just went on and on and on trying to come up with reasons why I should do it. And the reason why is because they actually do believe that I'm the person who's deceitful. So they believe that I would definitely take the option if I had it. They believe that I'm trying to get power over people, and do you, do you know what I mean? That, that's yeah. what they believe, and, and they can't understand me at all at the moment, which is really interesting, I find, because they can't, they've never met a person like me, to be frank, who does not um, utilise whatever media is at their disposal to do whatever they desire to do. And so... so um, they're all having a lot of trouble with me in Australia and elsewhere. We, when we go back to the UK, we've got another uh, interview, a journalist over there who wants to interview us as well. And in future... We, we saw the opportunity to give you a good round. <laughs> it won't come across... So they heard it. So they it heard won't it. come across that way, and you fell into the trap of evil, actually. Nah. To be, to be frank. Yes, you did. Fell into the trap of evil, and this is something I want to discuss with you. So, can I ask you a question about that, please? Yep. <laughs> um, where is the, I, this is an interesting ethical question for me about where is the line where we speak up for truth, and where is the line where we say, "Now I'm engaging with evil." Do you understand? I what a, completely what understand the question. <laughs> Falling into the trap of evil is all about your emotion. It's not about what you do. It's about the emotion you exchange with evil. Do you understand? Now, most of us don't understand what I've just said, so I'll elucidate. Um, when we have an emotion, an addiction, so let's say this is some myself, and I have an addiction. Let's say my addiction is I feel the world is unjust. Let's say that's the feeling that I have inside of me. And the addiction is I want to make the world just as a result of this addiction. So I want to try to force the world to face its own injustice and make the world change. Right? So when I have this unjust feeling within me, where I feel a lot of grief about injustice that I have not allowed myself to feel, what happens is I go around then trying to make the world just. I have this feeling coming out of me, and I'm going to try to force situations and everything into being just. Right? So when somebody from the media comes along, with a camera, and he's got a spirit or two with him, he knows exactly what to manipulate. Because he can see this, he just tries with different hooks, and usually they have spirits helping them do this, of course, a person in the spirit world going, yeah, this person's got this issue with injustice. All you've got to do is say something that makes them feel this issue of injustice, and they'll talk until the, you know, they'll talk for the next hour. And in that talking, you'll get a lot of footage. You'll get a lot of footage about all sorts of things that, that you can then manipulate and edit, carefully edit cut out this, cut out this 10 seconds and that 20 seconds, and before you know it, you've got the person saying almost totally the opposite thing than what they were actually saying, just by this editing process, right? Now, what they do, so what, what the problem is, is this emotion inside of me has actually allowed me to be hooked into the process that evil then uses to meet its own ends. Do you understand? It actually allows me 
to if this person here, me, to, to actually start to feel this addiction of mine, which is I want to make the world just, I want to make the world just. So now I've got an opportunity in front of the camera, you know, the media that might go to air, I am going to take this opportunity and make the world just, right? And in that process, the person on the other end of the camera, they're just merrily taking away the footage. Yeah, because we can skip, skillfully edit all of this footage to the point where what you've said is unrecognisable. That's the reality. Right? And my feeling is, you engage it, like, if you were aware of this um, emotion within you, you wouldn't engage the media just because of the emotion. But, but most of us do. We engage them just because of a specific emotion within us. When we engage in truth, so when I am in truth, I will engage the person who's in evil in a state of love, which we'll talk about a lot more today. In this state of love, I recognise that they're going to use information against me. I understand that that's their purpose because I can feel their purpose, I can feel their intention. When you're in a state of love, you can automatically feel people's intentions quite clearly. But I will still tell them the truth once to give them an opportunity to change. I will engage them, not to fulfil my own addiction, but to give them the opportunity to change. Do you understand the difference? In the first instance, I'm, I'm engaging them to fulfil my feeling that I want to make the world just, which is an addiction that I have. And therefore, I'm in an addictive relationship with an evil person who is going to manipulate this thing, guaranteed, pretty much. When I'm in a state of truth, I'm aware that they're going to manipulate anything I say, but because I'm in a state of love, I will give them the gift of this truth as long for the first time. I won't continue engaging it and continue engaging it. I'll give them the gift of truth and see whether they take the opportunity to change. If they take the opportunity to change, that's fantastic. If they demonstrate their evil, then the next time they ask you for another opportunity, you tell them about their evil. You say, no, no. Last time I engaged this opportunity with you, you manipulated the truth. You have demonstrated to me that you're evil and you need to change before I will actually engage you again. And this man went through all sorts of things. He, he asked me for forgiveness and all that. <laughs> Honestly, he, he tried to manipulate out of me uh, an interview. And, and I just said, you don't understand. You still don't understand. And, and every time he came up with another explanation, I said to him, you don't understand. Again, you don't understand. This issue, I'm not upset. Like, <laughs> it's an issue of truth. You're out of harmony of truth. I can't re-engage it. I can't. Until you get into harmony of truth somehow. I can't re-engage it. And then he'd come up with another explanation. I said, you still don't understand. I'm not angry. I can't re-engage you because you're out of harmony with truth. You, I can't do it. And then he comes up with another explanation and says, I'm sorry, you still don't understand. Like, and I said to him a number of times like that, you do not understand me at all because you don't understand that I'm only going to engage you when you now prove to me that your organisation, Channel 9 in this case in, in Australia, is actually going to deal with me in, with integrity and truth. They are the only types of relationships I want in my entire life. I only want integrity and truth type relationships. You've demonstrated, your company has demonstrated, and your actions today have demonstrated to me that you're totally out of harmony with that. So I can't engage you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Mary, you want to tell me? So um, I feel it's very clear because you were in a state of love with these people and I observed you last night, you were very loving um, to everyone in the room, including the guys who had sort of come to expose something mm -hmm. and then with the journalist afterwards. For me, and as all of you know, in Australia I did some interviews with the media and 
I was very afraid, so that's not love. <laughs> but I had a feeling in me of... Some of it I can see was error. Some of it was a bit stand by your man. Uh, <laughs> um, which is not a loving thing. No. Um, but I did have a sense of I don't want to hide who I am. Yeah. I, don't, I, I feel someone's come knocking on my door and asking me about myself. If I hide this, then I'm not honouring the truth of what I feel, what, I, what my experience is. Mm -hmm. So I engaged with that process. Mm -hmm. And it was scary. And also then they completely falsified everything about us and tried to make me look crazy as well as you. And I then, I didn't grieve about that either, yeah. <laughs> properly. Yeah. Like I, This was our first set of interviews in Australia. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yesterday when the media guys came, I immediately just started shaking. Like the fear that I was denying about the past experience was with me then. Yeah. Um, not for any rational reason, I couldn't understand why. I knew what they were going to do, knew what it was all about, but I just couldn't stop shaking. Yeah. And then when you were speaking with the guy, I felt this feeling of, there's truth here, but I could feel that I, there was a pressure behind me wanting to say the truth. I felt there I need to... There was beginning to be anger that I wanted to put out there because I felt they'd done me wrong. So I had to shut up and just sit there. Yeah. I guess why I'm explaining all this is because I feel that a lot of people here, as well as myself, still grapple with when, when am I loving, when am I just saying truth, when is it right to sit back and own my stuff, because I do feel there is an issue of hiding ourselves and hiding our truth, which is not honouring our experience no. or love or God or any of those things. The key, the key I feel, is more about your own addiction. Yeah. So you need to recognise your own addictions. So if you have an addiction to, to, uh, oh, towards, towards, like I mentioned earlier, injustice. Yes. So one of the yesterday during the conversation that we had with uh, with the media people, you felt that injustice to a degree, and at times you wanted to actually, <laughs> Mary actually, could feel the injustice of the whole thing. And she wanted to speak up about it, yeah. and and in particular, she felt the injustice with the woman who was present. Didn't you like? You I felt, felt she was things. being dishonest. Totally she may dishonest. go to church and be a Christian, but the way she asked her questions was very specifically. It was waited till the camera was on you, and it was also specifically phrased to get you to say, "I'm." You know, she wasn't telling us the truth. No, and that really. Um, and even when I confronted that in her, she denied it again. She denied also. it again, yeah. yeah. And then that, that made her <coughs> feel a bit upset once she denied it the second time. Yeah. yeah. And that's when Mary had to just be quiet after that. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's when it gets out of hand to see that. And what we need to do is actually look at... One of the things I didn't take cover with you yesterday is what we do, what, what evil does, the psychology of evil, is what I'd like to probably mention to you first before we talk about how it's resolved. Um, I, w I was a little bit uncertain. It, I felt like there was a red flag on that side of the room. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then I was like, I'm not too sure what that is. Like, I don't want to be judgmental. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, later on, uh, there was an uneasy feeling when the media came in. Mm -hmm. And then I felt a little bit of an anxiety. Yeah, from, well, Mary had a lot yeah, of anxiety. Yeah, I felt a little bit of anxiety. And yeah. then I was like, okay, well, I don't know what to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I just thanked you guys and then I went on my way. Yeah. But I didn't recognize the full intention. Yeah, I just right. felt a, a, a slight red flag, like yeah. something's unsafe here. Yeah. So. so what causes us to not see the full intention? Yeah. Can you see? Yeah. Like, yeah, there's obviously a denial of the full intention. Because yeah. the, the reality is we can feel everyone around us if we're open to the feelings of everyone. So when I don't feel the full intention of a person, that means I'm quite frightened of their full intention. And that causes us to be quite shut down towards what they're actually considering doing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to I wanna say something to my part in that all, yeah. and my own addiction. <clears throat> uh, my own addiction of, oh, I can help them, I, I know that. Um, I was in the lobby, and I overheard the reception person saying, H.A. Miller, no, no, he's not here, he's not here. And he said a couple of times, no, he's not here. H.A. Miller, no. And I assumed, 
I can help. I know he's here. Yeah. Somebody <laughs> is ringing if it's happening here, the event. Yeah. Yeah. And so I said, no, no, he's here. Uh, H.I. and Mary are here. And she said, Mary, Mary. And then she looked, ah, oh, Mary Luck. And so then so I felt guilty. Had a list of the names and yeah, no, no, the, the, the reception the people yeah. said that on the phone, Mary. Oh, oh it yeah. could be Mary oh, Luck. The bookings in Mary's name. Yeah. yeah but after, but actually, there was, there was a slight thing in my mind, or the spirits or not, to actually not do what I usually do and say, yeah, yeah, I know it, I can help you. But I didn't listen to that because of my addiction to, yeah. oh, I can help, yeah. yeah. There was a number so, of situations. Mary was in an addiction to, like, so, so what happened for Mary is that uh, the guy come in and asked to bring a camera and everything, and I, I said to Mary when she talked to me about it in the break, I said, well, who, is it? who are they from? She said, I didn't check. And I said, well, if they're from Channel 9 or Channel 7, then we don't want them in. And that needs to be explained. So why didn't you ask? And, and Mary then realised the reason why she didn't ask was because she was afraid. Right, so, so she just felt she had to complain. I was very certain that they wouldn't film you guys without your consent. But I knew AJ is OK to be filmed. But I, I, I was so terrified that yeah. I didn't. Whereas what I would have done if it was me on the doorway, I would have said, yeah, who are you from? And uh, they would have gone, well, oh, Channel 9 in Australia or whatever. And I said, well, yeah, the last time I did interviews with you guys, you just completely falsified the entire thing. And, and in fact, we, myself and Mary received about a thousand emails of threatening death threats and all sorts of things as a result of their presentation, um, and which were all false information that they presented. And I said, so, so no, you can't come in. <laughs> and no, I would have left it like that if it was me, you see. And the, the reason why is I'm not afraid of what the media will do with that either. Like, they can say, oh, He's having closed meetings now. He doesn't let anyone. <laughs> <know. laughs> and, and that's fine too. You know, secret it cult work. meetings. Yeah, <laughs> secret cult meetings. Yeah. Well, AJ, um, he asked me if, if if I thought you were Jesus. Yeah. And I said, well, it doesn't matter. The message is good. Yeah. And then then I said, well, look it. Um, horses don't have baby chickens. Even I said even. Even religions, <laughs> even religions say that God is our Father. That means we're at least godless, yeah. correct? I mean, how could we be anything other than God if God is our Father? Like I said, horses don't have baby chickens. So, what AJ is doing here is helping us find that God within ourselves. And that's a very good thing. Well, it's very interesting you say that, because that's not what I'm doing. <laughs> well, that's what I was wishing you were doing. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not at all addicted or, you know, I just, I get media coverage in Arizona a lot. And yeah. sometimes it's good, sometimes it ain't. And I'm not addicted to it one way or the other. It's just kind of fun for me. Yeah. But I figured I was standing up for you, but not in a way that but would make you, it seem like, oh, I'm here to protect AJ or but anything. Can you see you thought you were standing up for me, but you actually presented an untruth about what I'm teaching? Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But that's okay. You know, this, is, this often happens in Australia, too, where somebody thinks they're standing up for me because they think I'm a nice fellow. <laughs> but they actually then say something about my teachings that are not that are not true. Well, I guess it would be about my own then. Exactly. And so therefore you're there's a bit of an addiction about pre presenting your own ideas about something rather than rather than what I'm actually saying about it. Does that yeah. make sense? And that's fine, you're allowed to do that. But it's interesting how our own so, so if you think of what the media is going to do with that now, is it because because now they're going to say that I'm teaching people they can be God when the reality is if, if, in fact, they actually put on what I said about God is our Father, we must be at least godless, yeah. that should get some people thinking about something. Sure, but, uh, but it actually misrepresents what I'm teaching. Yeah, well, I, oh well. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. And, and, but this is, where, this is where we often fall into traps, you see, because of different emotions we have. We fall into traps. So the emotion you had was, oh, I want to help AJ out here. He's a nice chap. He's a nice fella. And yeah, this is an opportunity. That's the addiction. The addiction to help somebody out who, who seems to be in trouble, and I don't feel like I'm in trouble with the media at all. Um, but that, that addiction causes them to take an action 
that then is based on some of our emotions that get inflected into the action and then something gets misrepresented. And that's often what happens. So in Australia, we've had many of our friends get interviewed, many of whom misrepresented what I taught. <laughs> As a result, they just like me. They know, they know I'm a nice fellow. They, they can feel my integrity and they can feel my love for them. But they don't agree with everything that I'm teaching them, of course. And that's, that's okay. Like I, I still love them, even though they don't agree with everything I'm teaching. But, but then when the media interviews them, they then tell their part, and that just confuses the waters in terms of what finishes up getting pre presented. Well, that's good. Then we, co we confuse them then. That's good, isn't it? <laughs> 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 the truth never confuses anybody. <laughs> the truth is always enlightening. The truth is always... And it, this is why in the first century I used the terminology that you can become the light of the world only by being in a state of truth and love. So, so, and that's why I also use the term, the truth will set you free. Because the, the truth has so much power. If we confuse people, we're actually adding to the confusion on the planet. And that, that I don't feel is a very good, it's, a very, it's not a very loving action to take, to add to people's confusion. We want to take away from their confusion. We want to lighten things, you know, show the light on things, rather than cause them to still wander around, you know, blindly in the dark, as I often mentioned people were doing in the first century. So, so it's very important to, and what, this is one thing I would like to discuss about the evil side of things, what, what actions we take in the justification of ourselves that often can be associated or pander to evil. And it's very important for us to see these things. Carol. So, in my going to my room and this lovely woman misrepresenting herself mm -hmm. coming after me, I was in really a state of love and appreciation. Can I firstly address uh, what you called her? A lovely... <laughs> Outside. <laughs> her facade. A lovely facade. Uh, I agree totally. Yeah. 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 So a lovely facade. But here's the thing. Even though I see that it's a lovely facade, I feel her. I feel a part of her that was want, a, a deeper place. The something in me feels a deeper place in her. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I'm not, yeah, me too. I'm, I'm not pushing away from the facade. So when she came to me and asked if I would answer, if you be willing, open to answer a few questions, mm -hmm. I didn't feel the need to. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like the desire to, but I just felt the willingness to. And in love. And so each time when a question would be asked that I could feel them wanting me to wanting to steer me, mm -hmm. you know, like cattle, I, I would... This is where you're actually confusing yourself. Okay, great. The fact that they wanted to steer you... Uh, yeah? <laughs> it's not a word I often Right. <laughs> Very Texan. <laughs> 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 With your shirt. <laughs> it's, it indicates that um, you saw the manipulation. Right? You felt yourself being steered, so you saw the manipulation. Yeah, halfway through. Halfway through. Halfway right. through. So, right. you, so even if it was halfway through, that's fine. Right. You saw the manipulation. So you realized that you were being manipulated. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were in a state of love, you would have stopped the conversation at that point and you would have told her the truth. That's you are now just attempting to manipulate me. This is not very nice. Now, in that process of telling her the truth, you are actually being far more loving than you were up at that point because she now has the opportunity to change something that's unloving within her. So when you feel yourself being manipulated by another person, at that moment, if you are in truth, at that moment, you would stop. You would stop the entire conversation and you would actually extend the truth. If you love the person, you would extend the truth to them, which is, you are now manipulating me. Very interesting. Why would you want to do that? What's your motive for trying to manipulate me? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that then would have turned into a very different conversation. Yeah. She would have either got very angry with you 
or denied it all, or all those kind of yeah, things. Yeah, was it with her? It was the, with the interview. Oh, with them. Yeah, yeah I with didn't have interview. a con I didn't have a conversation with her. Oh, sorry, with the interviewer. Yeah, it was it was with the interviewer, and it was only when he asked me questions that felt clear when the question was asked, just like, "Do you yeah. believe he is Jesus?" But this is where this is where you felt sometime during the interview that you were being That's manipulated, and, I have, yeah. and a loving course of action yeah. would have been to, to address, address that. that. That's, yeah, does that okay. make sense? Right, yes, right there and then. Yes. Right. Now, the, for the majority of us, we don't address it there and then because we're afraid, we're afraid of what's going to happen after that. Yes, Marina. I had a very interesting truth. I was hit with something very interesting. Um, I find myself to be like a vibey person and really good and like in tune with people's emotions mm -hmm. on most days mm -hmm. usually. And what I found was that I saw this girl and I thought she was so pretty and I was completely blindsided yeah. with her inner her motivation. Yeah. And because everyone was talking about it, I was like, her really? She knew that guy? And then when the gentleman came in, because I'm very sensitive to threatening and menacing men, yeah. of course. Um, and he, she, yes, and she came, and he came in to Mary, and then I just felt Mary's being just go <laughs> like yeah. this, and I was just like, oh my god, I just want to like take this dude out of the room because the whole energy of the whole space changed the moment they of walked course. in. I felt that yeah. he was very rude, even interrupting. <laughs> yeah, um, I really felt like that too, but I don't feel it's my place to say anything. But I yeah. wanted to rescue her. Well, it is always your place to say something. Oh, it is. You're very rude interrupting us here. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Yeah, yeah, really? Yeah. Oh, that's good. To you know. put up your hand and say, AJ, can I have something to say? Yeah, yeah. no worries. This man's very rude interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I said, I agree. <laughs> I, and I just found it very interesting. I don't know if anybody else can relate how sometimes, you know, this external thing that I have an issue that I really like attractive people. Yeah. And when people are very externally, what I find to be externally attractive, yeah. I become completely blindsided <laughs> by, like, They're even though, yeah, true. and she, I mean, she was looking at people up and down, and I could see that she had this thing. I was like, oh, maybe she just has, like, a mommy issue or something. But, <laughs> but it was very interesting that I noticed that, mm. and, like, how yeah. sometimes, you know... And this is what we often do as well. We, we look at the outward appearance of an individual and not seeing their true character, or we overlook their true character because we like their outward appearance, yeah? Yeah. And this often happens too. I had the same reaction to her yeah. when I saw her... She's young and beautiful, yeah. um, and she was clear in her expression of what she said. And I thought, wow, somebody from Texas who heard about you being here and hightailed it up here. Yeah, I was completely taken by yeah. that. And, and she was being totally deceitful about it. Yeah, her. and I didn't, I didn't feel it. And again, you know, because she was beautiful, it's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And also, when the men walked in, I had a different feeling about them. Which indicates that there's an openness to a woman being evil. No, no, and not, and wait a minute, open this to... Uh, you, you allow... Oh, okay, you got it. You automatically allow the woman to be evil because of other things you're overlooking. Right. Does that make sense? Right. But when the man is in who you can feel is a bit evil, then you're really confronted. Yeah. So well, yeah, I so could feel a difference, that's all. I didn't think much about it. So but if you we had spirits around us, which type of spirits would find it easy to manipulate you with their evil? We're men. We're men. Yeah, We're men. women who sure. are evil. Sure. And, and with him, I, I th he looked media, he was next to the cameraman or something, and yeah. I also had this thing about media, but I didn't think she had anything to do with it. Exactly, so. yeah. 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 It was all very canned. Didn't you see how she asked that question just when the camera was there? She had an opportunity for three and a half hours before then to ask yeah. the question. Yeah. 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 Didn't ask any of it. Just when the camera went in, she noticed when it went in, saw the interaction, everything happened. Now she was in her yeah. actress mode. Yeah. I had a totally different reaction. Like, I didn't find her beautiful. I, th I thought she was really, I felt really repelled. Because you're fairly sensitive to the spirits with her. Right. In fact, she wasn't even there in her eyes. That's correct. She was totally, completely, not that. completely the spirits overcooked. The was very dark. Yeah, very it was dark. awful. It was painful for me. Yeah. And um, the anger, the anger and the intensity of her energy. And I kept looking at her and when she had a really... the intensity of the energy... It's far better to define the emotion. So, okay. so what emotions did you feel from her that confronted you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anger. That's so anger was anger. one of them. So, yeah. Yeah, so you could feel her anger. You could actually see her anger in her face as well. She's mm -hmm. quite... Quite well, I also felt a strong male presence with her. She looked ma masculine to Very me. Very true. There are men spirits with her. Yes, yeah, so she didn't look like a woman. gratification, actually. But, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so then my question is... 
Was I supposed to do something about that? Because I just sat there going like, okay. You don't have to do anything about it, no. And um, all we need to do is just feel about it. Because when we feel about it, we go, okay, there's this person, what do I feel about it? Oh, I'm a bit afraid of a woman's anger, for example. So, so anything that makes you feel sensitive or makes you feel uncomfortable is always a great indication that there's something underneath that you need to allow yourself to go to. All right? so, so, so while I was speaking, I could feel this uh, corner here being quite, uh, you know, in a different space to the rest of, the rest of you present. Um, and if I feel any discomfort about all that, I just allow myself to feel it. I just need to check whether my mic's actually working properly, which it is, yeah. So I allow myself to feel it, and, uh, and in the process of allowing myself to feel it, hopefully I'll deal with something in that process. Um, and all I did was wait, 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 wait for the undoubtable <laughs> reason why they were there to appear. Does that make sense? Interestingly enough, Mary and I's spirit guides uh, said to us in the morning that something would happen. Um, but I didn't give Mary the complete details because, because, because Mary been... would have tried to preempt the fear. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. so they, they didn't tell us the complete details of it. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, I actively felt something as well from Liz, but I chose to engage her and ask her why she was here. And when she turned and looked at me, I couldn't even hear what she said because of that darkness that I yeah. completely felt. Yeah. But I didn't even, I was not aware, I was so engaged in what you were talking about, I wasn't even aware of the camera and all that was going on. Yeah. And when she asked you that question, I second-guessed myself, and I do that a lot yeah. with um, not trusting that, I call it the safety shut-off yeah. valve, yeah. within myself to know that I have that awareness. I can know that truth about yes. somebody. Yes. So what happens with a lot of people, and this is something that's happening to yourself, is you instantly feel the fear that the darkness brings up in you, and then we automatically try to detune from this fear. But the problem with detuning from the fear is we're now not sensitive to our own inclination of what we should do. Yeah. You see, what we finish up doing then is... We, we finish up actually not listening to this little inner voice that we've got going, no, no, something's wrong here, something's wrong here. And we continue to engage the situation on the facade rather than engaging at, at the actual level. So, so engaging it at the actual level would be, no, there's something wrong here. I don't actually believe what you're saying to me. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed to say that, by the way, to people. Mm -hmm. I don't believe what you're saying to me. Mm -hmm. My law of attraction continuously presents that to me, those yep. situations. Yep. And, I'm, and I haven't got into really feeling the emotion behind that and the injury is with my parents. Yep. Um, yep. But intellectually, I know it at least now. You I know just... it's there. See, the beauty of our law of attraction, or God's law of attraction with your soul condition, is that is the law of attraction is bringing you the events, usually day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. Day by minute. minute. <laughs> yeah. And most of the time... It's like, that one went past, that one went past, that one went past, that one went past. <laughs> oh, yeah, I saw that one. <laughs> and, and so forth. That's a lot of times how the law of attraction works for us, yeah. yeah. Oh, so, AJ, when he came in and he, he sat by me, somehow he knew I was the hostess or something. And I do not like that. That is uncomfortable for me. Yeah, yeah. So, um... He was asking me if he could film, and I was like, oh, you know, usually AJ lets you film him, but go ask Mary. You know, I was like, throw it at Mary. <laughs> and then I felt bad because I could tell she was really uncomfortable. It was with really it good too. for Mary. It was good Absolutely for Mary. perfect. Yeah. Oh. I have a lot of gratitude that it worked away because it triggered everything in me. Okay. And I had to make the call. It was me, it wasn't AJ, and I was like, oh. <laughs> and that's good for, for yeah. her to do it. And you? then when um, I could tell he was trying to use his charms on me, he's like, hey, you know, you're in charge or whatever. And then when he asked to interview me, I thought I was trying to address my fears because I'm afraid to be on the camera. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, um, but I thought I did pretty good. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'll just look right at him. Yeah. And he started to tear up, and I thought, okay, you know, am I affecting him? But I just kind of tried, you know. And then I went home, I got, and Tom said he noticed it too, and I thought, 
Like I thought, well, maybe he was trying to manipulate me to get me to cry yeah. when I was talking to him because he maybe noticed I was getting nervous. In Australia, uh, most of the interviewers are very, very... They're looking for people to go through an emotional reaction while they're interviewing them. Right. And so what they do, even in the... You know, in the presentation sometimes, there's people who cry because of what they say to me and, and my openness to hearing what they're saying about their life and so forth. The camera goes straight on to them, like every single time. There was uh, one person who was uh, in, in Australia who was spirit overcloaked at the back <coughs> of the room and, and he was on the floor overcloaked. And none of, my, <coughs> none of my business, he's allowed to be overcloaked if he wants to be. But uh, the cameras went straight up to him, straight on him, show, you know, show all of that. Um, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for controversial footage so that they can display things that this is what's going on with the cult leader and the cult leader and all those kind of things and he's manipulating their emotions and all those kind of things. And, uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a very clever facade, uh, manipulated by a lot of very dark spirits, um, trying to muddy the waters of divine truth on the planet, basically. That's their underlying cause. It's interesting, like I said to the guy yesterday, I said, look, there's hundreds of thousands of other guys claiming to be Jesus on this planet. Why is it that you're following me around? Right. The only, they don't realise, but the only reason they're following me around is because the spirits with them know that I'm the actual Jesus. <laughs> That's the only reason they're following me around. Because they want the spirits with them want to... Um, muddy the waters associated anything to do with myself and this has been going on now for quite a few years uh, in the spirit world and now the media is involved it's going to probably go on for a while yet uh, yeah. is the reason that they want to muddy the waters of if you spreading the divine truth this is kind of going back to what you were talking about yesterday because this group of spirits does not want to deal with what is going on with them emotionally? Well, that's an underlying reason. But, mm -hmm. but see, when we examine the real emotional causes for anybody, we need to actually go from the top down in terms of analysing the reason. So, so if you really wanted to say the reasons in terms of the, in the layers that they actually appear, the top layer is this. The top layer is, in the hells, um, the spirits in the hells have control of the earth. Right? They, in the darkest of the hills, they have control of the earth. They have control of the earth in a number of different areas. There's women spirits who have control of most women on the earth. Right? And with the way that they approach control is that they are attempting to influence every single woman in a partnership or in a family to actually dominate the male in the relationship or in the family. That's what they're trying to do. That's their, their idea is you don't conquer from the top down, you conquer from the bottom up, from the family up. So they feel that if you can conquer every family by having the woman be the ruler of each family, then eventually the woman will rule the world. That's their viewpoint. These are all people who want to rule the world, by the way. There's another group of people who are very interested in the politi politics and the economics. In the spirit world I'm talking about now, there's groups of spirits who are very interested in these two areas, and then there's another group of spirits who are interested in the religious area, in the area of religion, religious control. Right. Now can you see that if you cover those four areas primarily, you've basically got control of the entire world, pretty much. Right. Now, when Jesus comes to earth, and whether you believe I am Jesus or not, it's immaterial. When Jesus comes to earth, who, what's he going to confront? Oh, He's going to confront every one of those systems by what confronts it? Truth. Truth, truth. truth confronts every system. As each, as each truth hits the universal stage, all of these areas are going to be confronted. These spirits with these people, the people don't realise this. The people don't even understand why they're following me around. Every time they come to interview me, they think, he's just an ordinary guy, pretty boring to talk to. <laughs> they do. I can feel their feelings quite strongly. And every single person who comes to interview me does not even know why their producer sent them to interview me. Mm -hmm. 
except for their claim that I'm Jesus. But there's, like I said, there's hundreds of thousands of other people on the planet claiming to be Jesus, and they don't go and interview them. In Australia, there's about 12 or 13 that I've heard of that are not committed in asylums who are saying they're Jesus, and they never go and interview them. And the reason why is because the spirits with these people know these spirits who are the bottom of the hills, with these people know who is going to be the person that affects them the most. If it ever gets a foothold, if divine truth ever gets a foothold on the planet, they realise it's going to have a huge impact on their life. You see, at the moment, the earth is basically surrounded by, by what you would call, what you and many of you have known about, by earthbound spirits who are totally interested in domination of the planet in an evil sense. Now, now, if the earth raises its condition into the second dimension, so if everyone here on the earth actually raised their condition to the second dimension in terms of their condition of love, not a single one of those spirits could ever influence the earth again. Now, you imagine what that feels like for those spirits. All of their controls would be gone. All of their manipulation would be gone. All of their addictions could no longer be met. They would be in this state now where none of their current frenzies could be engaged. That would have a powerful effect on them. They'd be, they'd be forced by the situation to go and deal with something. Now they know that. These spirits know that. And so there is a very, very strong feeling of all of these spirits banding together in order to primarily attack myself at this point in time so that none of the truths about any of these systems, about the errors in any of these systems, actually come out, or that anybody really notices them and still continues to allow them to be present. This is something that I've been aware of, of course, for a long time, for 2,000 years, <laughs> um, in terms of what's actually going on in the spirit world with regard to control of the earth. However, most people on the earth are not aware of the level of control that these spirits have over you. Your entire economic system is based, was created in fact, it was first conceived in the mind of the spirits who control the economic system of the world. It had nothing to do with what the, the people on earth were manipulated into forming that system. You've had, I think it's four presidents who tried to disband the system because they recognise it's evil. Every single one of them was assassinated. Yeah. So, so the reality is, these spirits have a very strong control over the earth and its systems. If you look in the religious side of things, there is this very strong, you, and you'll notice it, very strong movement towards what I would call fundamentalism. Yes. Yeah? The car bomb. Yes, where they justify religiously acts of violence. In other words, they religiously justify evil. Right? So there is a very strong uh, motivation from spirits who are in deep hells using religion as a means to control. Their belief is they're doing God a favour. Every person they kill is of an opposite religion. They're doing God a favour. They believe they're, they're worshipping God this way. You talk, when you talk to them, and we have, when you talk to them, they cannot see the error of what they are doing at all. They believe very, very strongly in their cause. Right? They are like the spirits in the Catholic Inquisition. Do you remember them? The, pe the, the people, the Pope and the other religious people in the Catholic in Inquisition during the 16th, 15th, 16th centuries. And they justify rape, murder, all sorts of things with a religious justification. Uh, you, you know they had the test. What did they call it? The, um, they, what they would do is generally they'd hang somebody up waiting for a confession. If you never confess, <coughs> right, then you'd die and that would prove your innocence. So they would torture you and tortured you until you died. And then when you died... That was proof that you were innocent. If you, if you, you know, if you uh, submitted, 
and, and said, no, no, I have done something wrong, whatever, then that was proof of your guilt. <laughs> that's, that's evil, is it not? Yes. Yeah. Well, the, the people who lead the religious movements in the spirit world are those spirits. I'm a, I'm, I'm a little confused. Yep. Um, tell me about, it, it, are there over-cloaking spirits working on the earth right now that are positive? Uh, and at, at the same time, I'm, I'm a little confused about spirit-guided messages. How do we discern? How do we know? Well, I've just given a series of talks about that in the different countries that we've gone, because a lot of people have asked the same question. And... Let's talk about, uh, just briefly, uh, what are we going to say, mate? No, it's okay. Well, uh, I wanted to talk more about what you were just putting on the board, so it's okay. Um, right. What do, you, what do you want to talk about? Uh, what occurred to me, or what I was feeling about, was um, you talking about these spirits, so it's about spirit influence, but these spirits who are in positions of evil. Yeah. And yesterday you touched briefly on the psychology of evil, and I was just reflecting... Um, some of the points I know that you want to cover today are, are a lot about the psychology of evil yes. and how many of us carry the same injuries and this makes it very easy for these people to influence us because we do feel it is justified if someone's hurt me I can hurt them back yes. which is actually evil yes. and so these guys find it qu quite easy to manipulate the earth yeah yeah, yeah. It's, and, and perhaps what we need to do is, com is continue with our discussion that we started yesterday because that will enlighten things a fair bit and then if we can come back to the question later today uh, as to how spirits actually do... There are some good spirits attempting to influence the Earth too, of course. Okay. So, so there are good spirits influencing the Earth. There are malevolent spirits. And in fact, one of the talks I, I, I've started giving in, in England, I've talked about the two types of good... primary two types of good spirits and, and a third type of good spirits in the previous talk just before we left England and when I go back to England, the next talk will be about the dark spirits that influence us. So I've actually talked about all the different types of spirits who influence us at, in other talks. And is that talk going to be then on the recording? Um, uh, well, that no, might not cost until you? we get back to Australia. I got you. Okay. And, and then it all has to be edited and so okay. forth. It's quite a job to edit all those talks and so forth. So let's go to the psychology of evil just for a second because I think it's important to understand it. Because, because when we start um, understanding the psychology of evil, we start seeing that actually for many of us there are still evil tendencies within us individually. Right? And this then helps us see how we are manipulated by others' evil. Does that make sense? So let's uh, begin with them. Now, I've written some of them down because there was quite a few of them I wanted to mention. One was that others, this is a justification for evil, others have attacked us us first. So in other words, I was attacked by somebody, so that now justifies me attacking them in return. Now, can you see this even goes down to someone was angry with me and I justify being angry with them in return because they started it. Right? As long as they started it, we're perfectly happy to go into evil. <laughs> Basically, that's what we're saying. Right? As long as somebody else starts it, I'm perfectly happy to engage it. Now, now this, is, this concept is a, is a very unloving concept, but, but it is in many of us, where we believe that it's okay to engage something as long as somebody else started it first. Now, it goes right the way through to wars even. Somebody provokes, 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 until the prov provocation becomes too great, and now they started it, we're going to finish it, is the attitude of evil. See that one is just others look like they're going to attack us. So what we do 
is we attack them first. We preemptively strike against them. Your government has practiced this as a as a foreign policy, as a life. Yeah. So so can you see that causes things to escalate quite rapidly? You then become the prov provocateur. Provocateur is it? <laughs> It's a big word. It's far beyond my... Uh, <laughs> um, and this is a problem, this whole justification for preemptively acting against a person, even if it's in anger. So, see, if we reduce this down to just being angry, somebody does something, and we feel anger, and then we go, well, you know... You know They've been angry with me in the past, so that justifies me getting angry with them. Well, now I'm in the cycle of evil. If it, if it justifies me attacking them before they're even upset with me, that is also, I'm now in the cycle of evil. Do you follow? Yeah. Okay. Others? No? Do what I want. <laughs> Now, it's, it's amazing how often we use that as a justification to attack others. They're not doing what we want, we want them to do what we want, and we're willing to go to some kind of length. Often anger is, again, the length that we're limited to, but you'd be surprised how many people resort to some other violence. You know? We often see this acted out in the pl playroom or the classroom, where children are reflecting the unhealed emotions of their parents in the classroom environment. So a child attacks another child because the parent already has the belief that it's okay to do that because the child didn't get what it wanted. Does that make sense? So, so it's not a justification for evil, but we use it as one. And by the way, whether what I wanted was wrong or right is immaterial because we always believe what we want is right. right? So, so for the person who engages this action, they're not concerned at well, does God think that's right? Or does, other, does society feel that's right? They're not concerned about any of those questions. They're only concerned about whether they think it's right. That's all. Yeah. Um, others... Others have been unjust. Our desire for justice gets us into huge amounts of trouble. Because true justice on the planet is very difficult to achieve given our personal limitations, as humanity's limitations. And when I say true justice, for example, let's say a murderer murders your child. Right? How do you get true justice? Now, most people would say, well, Let's go and murder his child. Or let's murder the murderer. Does any of them bring you real justice? None of those acts actually brings you a feeling of satisfaction that you've got your child back. Right? To, to have real justice, we would have to have our child back and the person have some kind of punishment. For many of us, that would be the satisfaction of real justice. But is it achievable? It's not achievable. Right? We can't bring a person back if they're already dead and their silver cord's been broken, they're gone for good from this, from this earth. When I say gone for good in a physical form, many of them are, over, you know, are still surrounding the earth, of course, because of the different attractions that occur, but we don't feel them as easily because we can't see them. And, and so we then go into this state where I've been treated unjustly. And then we go into this place where we justify evil acts because of the injustice that has been perpetrated towards ourselves. But there is no real justice here because you can't actually achieve it, particularly if someone's been murdered. You cannot achieve it. What if someone's been raped? How do you achieve that justice? How do you get justice if you've been raped? Cut their nuts off. Well, but does that achieve justice? You've still been raped. 
the, the rape is still within you, it's still a part of yourself, it still affects your entire life, it still affects your relationships, it affects who you've been, you know, who you're with, it affects their life, it affects so many different things. So how do you, you can't really achieve justice, can you? You're probably stuck with forgiveness. Well, you say we're stuck with forgiveness, <laughs> but forgiveness is a, definitely an act of love. But we'll talk about how we forgive, because it's very important to understand how we forgive. But can you see, when others have been unjust, we have this immediate reaction, most of us, of how dare they, you know, we, the anger rises. And then, for many of us, there's this automatic plan to even get them back, right? that rises within us. Now we're in the cycle, the psychology of evil. This is what, this is what evil does. Right? And it's okay to admit it, by the way. If you judge it, you can't admit it. And if you can't admit it, you can't change it. So, so we need to stop judging evil and we need to start admitting to it when we are. And then, we need, then we'll have the option to change it when we can. Right? There's another justification for evil. Religiously, this has happened throughout history. I've got a whole society of people who believe a whole different type of faith, and we're going to murder them unless they convert. Huh? When, when, um, if you look throughout history with almost every religious war, this is the underlying, this is the underlying principle. If the other person is wrong, and they don't change, I can murder them even to try to force them to be wrong. I can threaten them with their life to force them to, be, to accept that they're wrong. It is part of the psychology of evil. Can you see we even have that in a lot of our arguments with our wife or husband? <laughs> can you see that? Where we see that our partner as wrong and then that justifies our anger with them. It's the anger that's now in the evil cycle, right? Because we've got this underlying feeling inside of us that they are wrong. They are wrong. They are wrong. And it keeps playing in our, playing in our mind and then all these spirits come with us as well. Yes, she's wrong. She's wrong. You've got to say she's wrong. And then when you start saying it, you've got all these spirits with all their rage that they've not yet resolved. And now by this time you're swearing and yelling at her about how wrong she is. Who's wrong? You've just entered the cycle of evil. You're wrong. You know, in that place, you are out of harmony with love. So that's a very big motivation for it. Now, um, can you see these three in particular? Those three in particular are methods that most of us use as a justification for our unloving behaviour almost every day. Can you see, if, if, if the world's going to change on this issue... <laughs> We're going to need to start to see where we justify our own actions that are evil. Okay. And it's really fair to say that every spirit, every soul in the hells carries those belief systems. Every soul in the yeah. hells. So I really have yet to meet a person in the hells yeah. who hasn't had one, all of those beliefs actually yeah. regarding their justification of their evil acts. So it's really for them and for us to confront that this is, these things aren't serving us in love yeah. in our life, yeah. but also that they're evil and they're not love. The yeah. problem is, though, we do think they're serving us. Yeah. That's so that's what we have to see, isn't it? Yeah. That this isn't serving us, and that's they don't see that. And often I feel no. I don't see that. Well, you look at the spirits we spoke to yesterday, the the women who had been raped and, and murdered in the spirit world now. You know, they, when I tried to discuss some of these things with them, they were instantly confused and they were trying to say, but, but these men hurt us. And I said, I know they hurt you. I know they hurt you. I'm not saying they didn't hurt you. Right? I'm saying that while you then use that hurt as a justification to hurt other men on the earth through the women that you're, you're using to attack these men, you are now hurting men. <laughs> like, so you're doing the same as what other people have done to you now. So this is the problem, is that we justify doing the same thing of what others have done. But unfortunately, we even, we're even not that just about it. Because here's the person who's been harmed, 
here's the person who harmed him. Right? What finishes up happening is that this person generally is so afraid of that person, they don't try to harm the person back. What they do is they choose another person of the same gender who's easier to harm. And then they harm them. Every pedophile does this. Every single pedophile does this. This is their mum, in many cases, or their dad. Right? And instead, and they've been harmed by their mum or their dad. Instead of trying to harm their mum and dad back, what do they do? They choose a child, generally of the same gender, of where they receive the hurt from, and they try to harm the child. Right? It's the same principle. I'm just wondering if that same issue, you, if we would perpetrate it onto our spouses as well, if we had a, say, a damaging father and he was very controlling. We, we do it all the time with our spouses, <laughs> all the time. So here's our father, who we are still afraid of, even though we're a grown woman. Here's us, his daughter. Now, we won't say to our father, you've been a bad father, you've been terrible, you treated me badly, and all those kind of things, because we'll just get more treated badly. And often also, we're still seeking love from him. And approval. And approval and acceptance and so forth, right? So what we do is we marry someone who's not like our father, who's almost the opposite of our father, who allows us to abuse him. And he puts up with it, right? And now we have the satisfaction that we take out all of the stuff on him most of his life and uh, and yet the person who really deserved it was Dad. our father. If anybody <laughs> deserved it, it was him, not him. He's a nice man. Do you think he's going to end up a nice man? <laughs> if we do that. It's highly unlikely, right, that this man's going to have to be a very spiritually developed man to end up a nice man after being attacked by his wife for 30 years. Do you understand? I do. So, so, so this is the cycle that we start process, the processing of, right? And it's very important to see that this is what's going on, even in a lot of dynamics that we have going on. We're not even just with the way in which we use our rage. We use our rage against a person who will accept it, so it's accepted by this person, when the person who created our rage and our, our pain was this person. If we were just, we would put it against that person. But we're not being just because we're too afraid to be just. So what we do is we put it against that person. Okay. Many relationships play out like that. I once uh, spoke to a spirit in the spirit world. Uh, he came and visited me. Um, would have been five or six years ago now. He was a man who had reached the third sphere condition in the spirit world by the time he came to have a chat with me. And his wife had only just passed. He had passed six years prior to his wife. Now, in that six years, he had six years without his wife, right? And that, and that caused him to be able to progress. But as soon as his wife entered the spirit world, he felt drawn to go to where she was. Now, she was in the hells, and she didn't understand why she was in the hells, and she wanted him to get her out of the hells. So she kept projecting at him, you've got to get me out of hell, it's all your fault that you're here. And he was still in this addiction with her, feeling that it was his fault. But every time he'd go back to hell, he'd feel terrible, of course, because he could live in the third dimension, which, which if you compared the two places, are totally different to each other, right? And so, and so what he did was he come to me, to, they both came to me, to work out why... Um, he felt so drawn to go back down to her, even and why? And she was she was swearing and carrying on and saying how he should be there with her and so on. And she, she was quite upset. And when I explained to him that he was just accepting the rage of the woman all of his life, he just broke down and cried for quite some time. Right We're during our discussion, as soon as he did that, he realised that he didn't even love his wife. And when we started talking about the soulmate issue, he realised that he was actually gay. He'd been living with a, what, his, his, a woman who was like his mother for 40-something for years on Earth. He had a heart attack as a result. He, was a, he died from his sadness in his heart. And, and he passed over in the spirit world, not realising that as soon as she passed, he'd be drawn back exactly the same way into exactly the same relationship again. 
Let me think. Yeah, it's the same dynamic playing out. Exactly the same. Okay, now there's a few more we want to add to this. It's a fair few already, isn't there, really, when you think about it? A fair bit for us to, to examine. We are in pain, and I put pain in quotations because a lot of times what we think is painful is not that painful. That we don't want to feel. Now, this is, by the way, personally or as a society. Many societies get to be in pain. Right? So, for example, um, economic pain of a society causes many societies to justify um, attacking a, another society that has less economic pain. Right? This is exactly the justification that Hitler connected to in the, in the German people before World War II. Right? Because of the suppression from the treaties that happened in the 1920s, the, the, the German race felt under suppression economically and developmentally, and as a result of that, all of the German people generally had this psyche inside of themselves, this emotion inside of themselves, we're being oppressed by other countries, we're being controlled by other countries. A leader comes along and just expresses the exact emotion that all of the people felt. We're being oppressed economically and, and developmentally by other countries. They all agree, and so they support him. It doesn't matter what his other agendas are. <laughs> They're automatically feeling a justification to take action. Yep. We are in pain that we don't want to feel. It's a huge motivation that we have to actually take out our pain on others. We can even go down to the same thing. We are in, but even just discomfort is often a justification. We are uncomfortable. This is uh, and that we don't want to feel. And whether, and again, personally or as a society, we're uncomfortable. Um, our discomfort, our addictions to comfort are huge. In Western society, they're huge. Most of you, on a daily basis, would not be able to put up with what happens in the third world without having huge amounts of emotional responses to it. Many of us criticise the violence in those nations, not understanding that if we put ourselves in those exact same conditions, there's a high likelihood we would also turn to the same kind of violence. Right? And as, as Western society, we are addicted to our comforts. We are so addicted to our comforts that we're willing to rape other countries that are less wealthy than ourselves in order to support those comforts. That's the reality of our life. In fact, it is my very strong belief that unless Western society changes, the world has no hope to change. We have a responsibility to change first in Western society. We have the most comfort. We have a responsibility to change first. And then the last one I've written down, we do not, don't get... We feel we deserve. Now, in different countries, what you feel you deserve is different. Right? And that is very, very dependent upon what you grow up with, right? Very dependent on how, what society you've grown up with. So if you grow up with one, in one type of society, you might not have very strong opinions of what you feel you deserve in the same line as other societies. So in America, what do you feel you deserve? A lot of you feel like there is this American dream that is portrayed, isn't there? What's the American dream, basically? We deserve all to have freedom. a... Freedom. Freedom. House. 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 Wealth. Wealth. Happiness. Happiness. Electricity. Electricity. <laughs> <laughs> a, a, vehicle, a, a vehicle that we can uh, drive at any time. Now, if you grow up in uh, El Salvador... Which is, which is not that far yeah. south, right? what, what, uh, what would, you, would you think a car is a God-given right? No. 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 It's highly unlikely you think a car is a God-given right. Not even a donkey. It's not even a donkey, yeah. You'd be lucky to get a donkey, actually. 
So, so you, you'd be in a totally different state. Would you think that uh, a, a big two-storey house, 30, 30 square, uh, what is 30 square? Like, do you have square? You have square feet here, don't you? So let's say 5,000 square feet home. If you were down there, do you feel that you would feel that is the right? You'd be lucky to have a one-room home for your own and own, probably. Yeah? Would you feel even running water is a right in some countries? No. You'd have to go and actually walk for two or three kilometres with a, a donkey thing on, the on your shoulder and carry the water home for the day. So you wouldn't even think that is a right. Can you see, it just depends where we've grown up with as to what we believe is a right. In regards to El Salvador. Oh. In, in regard to El Salvador, it's interesting that you mentioned that because you knew my ex-wife, Yesenia. Yep. Um, she has associates in that country. That's where she's from. Yep. And there were actually people she knows who have been murdered because of jealousy of having a possession yeah. that others but, didn't yeah, have. Didn't yeah, have. I mean, yeah. just out of just that jealous emotion yep. caused, a, you know, a death. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was pretty, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other things, but, yeah. yeah. So, so this idea that we, if we don't get what we feel we deserve is very different for every country. Some countries have a much lower expectation of what they deserve than other countries. Other countries have a very, very high expectation of what you deserve. Um, this is one thing that fascinates me about your shopping here, like your food shopping, because there is a very high expectation in every American of what they feel they deserve to see in a shop. When an American comes to visit me, every single American that's ever come to visit me has been severely challenged by what's in our shops in Australia, <laughs> because it's not exactly what they expected to see, you see, because, it, because of this emotion. I deserve it, where is it? Like, what's going on? How do you live like this? And I've actually had them say that to me. How do you live like this? Um, really easily, actually. But, but it's interesting that we have a different level of what we feel we deserve. The problem with this, when we don't get what we feel we deserve, is how we respond. You see, it's always, with all of these things, it's how we're responding. This is... And there, I could come up with more, of course, but this is the basic underlying psychology of evil. This is where it all begins. This is where the unloving behaviour begins. Where we feel the justification for these things. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? Would you like to... Is there any questions you have about any of that? Um, Just wait for the mic. Yeah. On the last one, it, it seems like we don't even have to have that one, but just to have the fear of that. The fear that we're not going to get what we want is enough to create the Very evil. Very good point. Very good point. Just to being afraid that you're not going to get what you want yeah. is enough sometimes for us to justify some very severe actions. Very severe actions. I noticed that in myself. Yeah. In selling a lot of my stuff, if I don't think I'm getting what I deserve, I notice my, my desire to want to manipulate the truth. And yeah. I'm catching myself on it and praying about it, but it's like, wow, it's, it's big, there. Pretty big emotion. Yeah. 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 It happened in our interaction with the concert in Australia. Oh, you? that and some other things we've interacted about. Yes, exactly. the desire to just sh shift the truth a little bit to my advantage. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember we went to go uh, visit you all in Australia in 2009. I was astonished that you only had one flavor of hummus. And I, I told that story over and over in outrage that you, won't, you wouldn't believe how these savages live. <laughs> and, and it's true, we do. The only time we have multiple flavor of hummus is when we make it ourselves. <laughs> Generally, it's all very similar. Now we've had some changes recently <laughs> that we now have multiple flavors of hummus available in some supermarkets. But uh, the, the reality is, yeah, you have so much choice available to you here, and, and therefore you grow up, right from the time you're babies, you grow up with that choice, so therefore you feel you deserve the choice. And then when you go to another country, the choice is not available, and so there's an instant feeling or reaction. So, camera key? Yeah, they're not, not back in the Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for the camera for not turning back in. Yes. Yeah. Well, they they were just too deceitful yesterday for us to allow them back in today. So. 
Um, okay, so uh, I thought they might come to that. <laughs> okay, so can we see the psychology of evil? Yep. Okay. So, so what do we do with it? This is the good question, isn't it? How do we, how do we overcome this with love? What, what, what would love do in these situations? That's what we want to look at now. Now, do you feel like we'd like to have a bit of a break first before we consider what love would do? Sure. You, you're, everyone's uh, not crossing their legs and having a good thought. Yeah. yeah? Well, what if we have a 10 minute break then? Okay. Yeah. And, then and then we'll get started on the love side of the discussion. Yep.